Price is going to be probably touching, you know, uh, six digits. Every institution is going to own it. Every financial advisor is going to have given in. Even Vanguard is going to have given in. Look, I think the next 12 months are going to be truly spectacular, like truly spectacular. Yeah, you know, all demand. The supply, the supply shock happened. And so fair value was in the low 50s. I round down to 50. And and what a halving does is it doubles the fair value. And then the and then you get the final parabolic move through April of next year, where, you know, do we hit 150? Do we hit one? I don't really care. But everyone globally get in a wallet, understanding how to own some, opening an account with Welcome money. back to Crypto Insights. In this video, we will bring you the highlights from Mark Yesko's recent interview with Gary Cardone. As always, time is money, so don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. So the red dots are the, the parabolic move time. And so the next 12 months, I, you know, look, I think the next 12 months are going to be truly spectacular like truly spectacular. Yeah, you know, all demand. The supply the supply shock happened. And so fair value was in the low 50s, I round down to 50. And and what a having does is it doubles the fair value. The miners would go out of business if the price didn't increase. So now, it's a little different this time because of ordinals and runes and and the high transaction fees. So let's say it's not double this time. Let's say it's 80. Okay, so that's a fair value norm. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you look at Tim Peterson's Metcalf's Law model, it says fair value is about 80. If you look at uh, Charles Edwards' model that's based on conversion of electricity to value, so it's a, a, a power consumption based on hash rate, it says 80. That's interesting. I, you know, I have this rule. If I hear it once, I remember it. If I hear it twice, I write it down. If I hear it three times, I do something about it. So, so let's say that we got three independent you know, theories that all come up with the same fair value, 80K. So we're still below fair value today at 66. So we're going to accrete to fair value. Well, then what's going to happen? Well, then the FOMO is going to start to kick in because people are going to see, and look, I I said it on a couple of times. This Thanksgiving is going to be the best Thanksgiving in the history of Thanksgivings. I mean, maybe the first one was pretty good too, but this one's going to be amazing because the last few have sucked because, you know, you're that guy that's crypto and you're, you're kind of welcome, but you're not really welcome. And depending on when people took your advice or didn't take your advice, this one, everyone's going to love all of us because price is going to be, probably touching, you know, uh, six digits. Everyone's going to be talking about it. It's going to be everywhere. Every institution is going to own it. Every financial advisor is going to have given in. Even Vanguard is going to have given in. And look, this, and then, and then you get the final parabolic move through April of next year where, you know, do we hit 150? Do we hit one? I don't really care. But what I really care about is everyone, and I and I literally mean everyone, not just American, but everyone globally, get in a wallet, understanding how to own some, opening an account with one of the exchanges around, you know, we've invested in a bunch of them in different places, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Asia, you know, the Coinbase equivalent, understanding that this is the greatest savings technology. The other thing about savings, is you drop money into it every week, every month, uh, whatever, yep. and it accumulates over time. And then you take some out to replenish your spending. And for an hour, we're going to spend in fiat. Someday, maybe we spend in something else, stable coins or Bitcoin. I don't really care. Yeah. But this idea of a spending bucket to fund your lifestyle, a savings bucket that is your core asset, and then the the get rich bucket. I would say you know that's for the friends brother -in brother in law's condo deal. This hot stock tip from Roaring Kitty. I was joking, you lose all that, so keep it small. But, but that's okay. You know, trying to get rich is fine. But the stay rich savings technology could that be an increasing amount of of Bitcoin? Sure.
Should you have some venture capital in there? Yes. Should you have some energy in there? Yes. How fast we go parabolic will be determined, I believe, by leverage. How much leverage comes in the market? How many people use futures? Because you can have massive leverage with futures, right? You can put 3% down and lever up 33 times. In some cases, it's 99 to 1. The, 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 the price is going to move, but I don't think it's going to move as far because the, the amount of people who do the crazy leverage relative to the total amount. And so the impact, and so maybe we don't go all the way to 150, 160. Maybe we only get to one and a half times fair value, 1.7 times fair value. Normally we get to two to 2.3. But, and then the question to your, to your real question is, do people sell? Well, yes, the people who are just speculators and gamblers and leverage traders, they're going to sell. Will the long term, will the state of Wisconsin that just bought 100 billion, 100 billion, 100 million, 100 million, will they sell? No, because they have 0.1%. They're going to let that go to 0.2, then 0.3, then 0.4, maybe even 0.5. Put in 10 basis points, they're not going to rebalance. And so I do think there has been a fundamental demand shock. So aggregate supply, aggregate demand, okay? Demand shock, okay? Demand moves up, price goes up. All other things equal, which they are, and, and, and with Bitcoin, supply is not only fixed, it actually has leakage. Some coins are lost or stolen, right? It, it just, it's real. And so it is, from that perspective, a beautifully deflationary asset as opposed to an inflationary asset, the tools that are being used are very advanced, but they're very old in the sense that futures in commodity markets have been used against the average investor for decades. Well, what do I mean by that? Spoofing, right, which is selling futures to depress the price so you can go buy something and then sell it to people later for a profit and, and arbitraging, basically risk-free, a bunch of money has been going on in every market in the history of mankind since the advent of futures contracts. Well, why? Well, in the olden days, right, wildcatting oil days, if I wanted to sell you a barrel of oil, I actually had to have a physical barrel of oil because if we got to the settlement date and I didn't deliver you a barrel of oil, there was, there was a penalty. Well, these financial engineers came along and said, well, you know what? Maybe Mark and Gary don't really want to transact oil. They just want to speculate on the change in price. So Mark can write a contract that promises that he'll go get a barrel of oil and if they don't sell up the contract before the delivery date, then he has to actually go get the oil and deliver it. Well, that's all well and good, but what does that allow someone to do? That allows someone to then, out of thin air, create a contract, a paper barrel of oil, and they can sell it. How do you sell something that doesn't exist? It's interesting. Only if somebody will buy it. So basically you have this you know, creation of non-physical commodities. And when you get an imbalance between the physical commodities and the paper commodities, bad things happen. Think about 2016 when the price of oil, right, went down from 100 and something down to, I think got to 26 bucks before China came in and saved the world by buying futures like they were going out of style. And how they do that? They literally printed $4 trillion. Those financial advisors got the memo that they had to get off zero, right? They had to get off zero, 10 basis points. That's 30 billion bucks, okay? 30 billion bucks would, would have an impact on the price of Bitcoin. But 1%, which is not even a crazy number, 1% is 300 billion. 300 billion is more money 
than has ever been more currency, more fiat than has ever been converted into Bitcoin in the first 15 years of its life. People say, no, no, it's a trillion dollar asset. I said, yeah, but a trillion dollars has not gone in. Right. Only a couple hundred billion have actually converted into Bitcoin. Okay. The rest is bid ass spread and appreciation and network increase, Metcalf's law increase. So if you add 300 billion to an asset that hasn't had 300 billion go in, big moves were going to happen. And so, but your point about, well, which institutions were also going to come in, look, my whole life was about institutional investing. I, you know, I worked for two big allocators. I was paid to give money to these firms. I mean, all the people that, that everybody talks about now, you know, Druckenmiller, I had money with Stan Druckenmiller when he was at Soros, when he left Soros, when he ran Duquesne and, you know, Howard Marks, and, you know, in, in the news, I was one of the, you know, I and we were one of the first investors with Howard when he spun out of Trust Company of the West. So I, I'm just old. I've been around a long time and I've allocated these people. So I know, one, how much capital they have, two, how forward looking they are, and three, the type of liquidity they need in order to put their capital to work. Because we're talking billions, not you know thousands or millions. And so once there was this platform, BlackRock at all, because once they approved all of them, now we're talking real money is going to come in. And Coinbase, you know, gets adopted and, and is very stable. And so all of these things start to happen. And then the, the one that no one's even talking about is they put a little rule in at the very end where you had to have, I don't what they call it, an authorized participant, an AP. I can't, I can't remember what AP stands for, but it's, it's basically you have to have somebody legitimate stand behind you if you want to be an issuer. And JP Morgan said, yeah, we'll do it. Like, didn't your CEO say this was like a Ponzi scheme? So why are you willing to help with custody and transactions? And so once all of that happened, it was absolutely positively going to be fund after fund after fund. Now, the one little wrinkle, like everyone's like millennium, they own 1.9 billion. Nah, kind of. Kinda. I mean, on the day of the filing, they had long 1.9 billion. But the way Millennium works, most of their assets are long and short. So they're short something else. In many cases, they're probably long IBIT, short MSTR, because MSTR is selling at 1.7 times the underlying value of the Bitcoin. That's probably too high a premium. You know, the leverage gives you some premium, but 1.7 is probably too high. So they're long that they're, they're probably some of them are probably long IBIT and actually short Bitcoin. They actually might have a Coinbase account somewhere where they're they're short. Um, some of the underlying portfolio managers inside the Millennium umbrella. So it's not quite as unidirectional as saying, oh, yep, they own 1.9 billion long because there's a whole bunch of shorts on the same. Same thing with Jump Trading or Susquehanna. What you see on any one day doesn't mean that much. Or, or you know, God rest his soul, Jim Simon's one of the greatest uh, investors in in the history of mankind. Uh, I mean, definitely. I mean, that's not perhaps that's not hyperbole. It, it's true. He was he's in the top five probably of of all investors. And but what he show what showed up in his thirteen Fs is not really useful. One by the time you get it, forty five days later. He's had three or four, probably three or four dozen um, turn the capital. He doesn't own any of that stuff anymore. So there are different people. Like when when uh, Howard Marks shows up in his 13F, he's long. Wasn't a conversion of fiat. What's happening now is people are converting fiat into Bitcoin with the expectation, to your point, that it's going to be worth significantly more later and that is a massive change. It's a massive change. And 
I mean, we've been talking about it for a long time. I mean, you and I have been talking about it and other people have been talking about it, that getting off zero, right, having more than zero was inevitable. Right? There was just no way everyone wasn't going to have some exposure. Now, it doesn't have to be 80, 90, 100%, like some you know, DGEN or some early investor that got, you know, I shouldn't even say investor, someone who was lucky. And someone yeah. else does all the technology. And I know the hardcore Bitcoin maxis are like, no, no, not your keys. Not. I'm like, fine. Look, I got it that in a perfect world, total self-sovereignty and total control off the grid in your cold storage, definitely perfect and ideal. And in the future, but the problem is in a world of bearer assets, you've now reintroduced a whole bunch of risks. Like, you know, you and I have talked about this. I don't like the fact that it's kind of like the bad old days where you got to sit on your porch with your gun and hope that someone with a bigger gun doesn't come and say, hey, give me your, your Bitcoin. You are like, well, no, that could never happen. Well, of course it could happen. It's a bearer asset. If you have the seed phrase, someone can take it from you. And that's that's one problem. And so banks were created because people used to have all their wealth in their house and the bad guys would come steal it. And I'm like, well, let's put it in a bank. And then the bad guys would just go rob the bank. And I'm like, well, let's get bigger banks and then let's find a way to make it electronic and store it in New York. And then you can have access to it. And that helped, right? I would say, how much money has been stolen from the Fed? Zero dollars. How much money has been stolen from Bank of America's home office in New York? Zero dollars. Bank of America, El Paso, Texas. More than zero dollars. People lose money out of your purse or wallet all the time because it's far from the origin of the money. So how much money has been stolen from the Bitcoin blockchain? Zero dollars. Zero dollars. Not one hack, not one zero dollars. How about from Coinbase? Zero dollars. How about from smaller Mt. Gox-esque exchange? More than zero dollars. How about when people are trying to transact? More than zero dollars. How about people's wallet? More than zero dollars. So the further you are from the source, the more at risk it is. So we do need to figure out ways to manage OPSEC. There are 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis. Right. Up. That's plenty, right? That's plenty for everybody. And there's no question in my mind, right, that everyone from, I use the example of my granddaughter, right? My granddaughter's one and she's a Gen A, a Zoomer, right? So she'll never have a leather wallet. Never. She'll never Not have ever, right? She'll she will never, never touch paper money. Never. Because by the time she's able to open up a bank account, which you know used to be a rite of passage as a, as a teenager, she won't do that. She'll just have a wallet, a digital wallet with digital money. And is it possible that every microtransaction she does for the rest of her life will be in Bitcoin? Sure. But it's a small amount of the total number of Satoshis that'll just constantly swirl. The rest will be what it is, the perfect savings technology. So I have my savings bucket of Bitcoin, but I can have a small amount. Today it's fiat, but it's not even fiat. Today it's entries in a database and Visa or MasterCard. I use MasterCard. So that, that idea that someday everything, all currency, will be Bitcoin? Sure, it's possible. Holy moly, it'll take a long time for that to happen. And could there be other things that are better, faster, cheaper? Like, are stable coins better for that purpose? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, but there is a point also where Bitcoin could be so mature that the price doesn't move. Right now, all the people who are buying it to get rich would say, no, no, no. Price has number go up. I need number go up. No. What you need is 
value of the network to rise and your ownership stake increases in value, what is money? And we can talk about it, right? Okay. Gold is money. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. Yep. That's, that's gold. Okay. That's not debt. That's not currency. Now we talk about currency dollars, yen, euros as money. They're really not. They're, they're currencies. And that doesn't make them bad, less, you know, less good or, or worse. It's just they're different. Currencies are the things that we use as medium of exchange, not as a store of value. Money has been a store of value, true money, great gold for 5,000 years, 